first of all, I would like to apologize to uh, everybody uh, that my Bahasa is not good enough to hold this workshop and this presentation in Bahasa and Amusement. Not yet. Okay. Um, so please accept my apology and thank you to Dr. Chandra, my good friend, who will be doing the translation. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Dr. Chandra will always um, <coughs> translate. Second of all, I'd like to um, say a very heartfelt uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Leah yeah. uh, and Pepsi for inviting uh, MSF to, um, to give a little bit of a briefing on um, uh, health structure preparedness. It's a difficult topic, um, but hopefully what I can give today is a little bit of some uh, practical uh, experiences from MSF. Um, and again, if there are any questions or comments, please don't hesitate. Maybe I'll let Dr. Chandra translate. Okay, maybe you introduce yourself first. Um, okay. So my name is uh, Daniel von Reich. I have been working in uh, humanitarian aid and emergency response for about uh, 20 years. I've been working in uh, the Africas, the Americas, and the Asian continent. Um, I feel very at home here. I was born in Singapore, so uh, my childhood was in the region. Um, I've worked with primarily uh, conflict settings, um, but I've also worked in emergency responses linked to epidemic and, uh, and uh, infectious disease outbreaks. Not at this scale. I don't think any of us have. Um, uh, so hopefully my personal experience plus the experience from MSF can uh, can give some input. Ya, yeah. yeah. uh, terima kasih. Saya akan coba mentranslate dari Daniel. Jadi Daniel uh, merupakan country director dari Mission Sun Frontier Indonesia pada saat ini dengan 20 tahun pengalaman di beberapa benua uh, Asia Afrika untuk penanganan konflik, kemudian epidemik juga beberapa respons di epidemik yang terjadi di dunia dan juga banyak berkontribusi untuk uh, riset di uh, epidemik. Nah, hari ini kita akan ngebahas tentang persiapan rumah sakit. Memang ini satu hal yang sulit dan kita coba berbagi pengalaman dari apa yang pernah dilakukan di organisasi MSF. Nah, selanjutnya nanti akan kita coba uh, bangun pelan-pelan dan Kita coba ngelihat dan yang pasti dari awal kita sudah melihat kalau ini bukan clinical management, bukan satu pendekatan klinis yang coba akan kita kupas, tapi bagaimana tips and trick yang selama ini sudah pernah dilakukan oleh MSF di beberapa daerah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as Dr. Chandra mentioned, I'm not going to be talking about clinical management. Uh, I think that's a whole topic in for itself. Um, uh, I also want to stress that whatever I'm saying today uh, is never supposed to um, take the place of your national guidelines and your national protocols. Uh, these are simply MSF experiences and some of our recommendations. If they can be practical, useful for you, I'm very happy, but they should never replace what your government is putting in place. Okay? Okay. Ya, jadi apa yang kita bahas hari ini tidak akan menggantikan guidelines atau protokol yang akan yang sudah dibuat oleh Kementerian Kesehatan atau WHO, tapi coba melihat dari uh, pengalaman MSF dan rekomendasi yang sudah pernah kita lakukan dalam penanganan uh, epidemi. Oke. Okay. Um, so let's start the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, please. Oke. Okay. So the objectives of the session are um, we want to look a little bit at facility management as a whole, uh, taking into consideration, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, the specific contexts that you're all in, because uh, this country is one of the largest uh, countries in the world, spanning three time zones, 17,000 islands, uh, 260 million people. I don't think uh, there is one facility that is exactly the same as another one. So I think you're operating in very diverse contextual settings. Uh, and as this uh, uh, this uh, pandemic spreads and this local epidemic, 
I think you'll also see um, uh, epidemiological differences as well. Uh, the other objective is to look a little bit more at some of the prevention and control, infection prevention control measures that you can take from a management perspective, a facility management perspective, I'll get into that, uh, and some of the chemical protection uh, issues linked to that. So without further ado, um, maybe we go into the first slide. Yeah, yeah I will explain first. Mm -hmm. Uh, jadi hari ini kita akan coba ngelihat dari sesi yang akan kita bangun uh, bagaimana uh, melihat langkah strategi dalam mempersiapkan fasilitas kesehatan di epidemik yang sekarang dengan berbagai konteks dengan jarak dengan area yang sangat luas dan kita tidak bisa melihat satu permasalahan dengan dengan sudut yang sama karena berbeda rumah sakit berbeda uh, masalah yang akan dihadapin. Kemudian rekomendasi untuk pencegahan dan kontrol dari uh, infeksi berdasarkan situasi sekarang. Kemudian kita akan coba membuka sedikit tentang coronaviridae susceptibility uh, dengan beberapa tips and trick yang akan dijelaskan selanjutnya. So, um... We discussed a little bit whether we should uh, talk about uh, hospital preparedness plans, um, mass casualty plans, and so on. Um, what we're focusing on today, if you look at the cycle, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, in an emergency preparedness plan, you always have these different steps. You have the first step, which is mitigation which are the efforts to reduce the likelihood um, uh, of something happening. Then you have your preparedness step, which are the actions taken uh, prior to an emergency and to be able to have the best possible response, which is the next step. Um, those are the actions that you take during uh, the emergency. You've got the post-emergency recovery phase, you've got the prevention phase, and so on. Just to make it very clear, today we're going to talk about the preparedness phase only. Okay. Uh, sebelum kita masuk, kita coba ngelihat dari emergency preparedness plan uh, circle yang mungkin ini sudah umum buat uh, yang ada di sini. Jadi bagaimana kita pertama ngelihat mitigasi, usaha kita untuk mengurangi kecenderungan dan risiko, kemudian preparedness, kemudian Ketika sesuatu terjadi, kita melakukan respons, recovery, prevention, dan kembali lagi ke mitigasi. Nah, pada saat ini, sesi kali ini kita akan coba ngebuka di bagian preparedness. Jadi bagaimana kita melakukan persiapan sebelum uh, terjadi atau ketika sudah terjadi, apa persiapan yang harus kita siapkan. Hmm. Oke. Okay. Um. If I look at if we look at the basics of an emergency preparedness plan, and clearly there are all kinds of different plans that you put in place in an emergency that you can have as part of your preparedness, and especially looking at your facilities. Um, I was discussing with one of the colleagues about mass casualty plans that we're very used to. They're all very different. The basics of an emergency uh, response plan in this setting is they're very similar to mass casualty plans. Um, I hope that most hospitals out there have at least gone through mass casualty simulations, have discussed mass casualty plans. Clearly, when dealing with mass casualty plans, um, usually we're looking at natural disasters or other emergencies, such as uh, uh, a bus crash, um, where you have uh, where you have injured an influx of injured uh, patients coming in. Clearly, those mass casualty plans usually do not in, uh, involve infectious patients. Okay, jadi uh, kita ngelihat sekarang kalau tandanya bagaimana kita mengembangkan persiapan ini hampir sama dengan bagaimana ketika kita mengembangkan mass casualty plan, ketika kita harus bersiap ketika ada terjadi. Uh, Kecelakaan lalu lintas dengan 30 sampai 50 orang mungkin datang sekaligus ke fasilitas kesehatan. Kemudian mungkin ada natural disaster bencana yang 
mengharuskan kita siap untuk menerima pasien dalam jumlah yang banyak eh, secara mendasar ini sama dengan mengembangkan mass casualty plan dan eh, tadi setelah ngobrol Daniel dengan beberapa kolek di sini juga kalau mass casualty plan sudah menjadi sudah di training dan sudah dilakukan di beberapa rumah sakit ya. Um, equally, I'm sure that most of the private-run uh, hospitals, but even the public hospitals, uh, you probably have a business continuity plan. Um, if you're based on a revenue and an income generating, revenue generating um, uh, uh, business plan, then of course you have to think about how can my business continue. Uh, I think in any emergency response, you have a com combination of mass casualty, business continuity uh, that, we're, that we're looking at. Yeah, selain mass casualty plan, ada juga business continuity plan. Bagaimana kita membuat apa yang sedang kita lakukan tetap bisa berlanjut dengan segala uh, kepentingan, dengan segala apa yang sedang kita lakukan. Dan uh, mass casualty plan dengan business continuity plan harus punya satu satu uh, korelasi. The business continuity plan does not only mean that it does not only affect private businesses. Obviously, business yeah. continuity plan implies the behind the scenes um, services such as your human resource department, your supply department, and all of the other support departments as well. Whereas a mass casualty plan generally um, uh, is a plan specifically for a medical department but we will get into the into departmentality of this ya yeah. pada business continuity plan bukan hanya melihat sebagai satu area bisnis tapi bagaimana kita melihat dalam satu manajemen ada fungsi human resource ada fungsi supply ada fungsi logistik kemudian kalau kita ngomongin mass casualty plan kita akan ngomongin tentang medical jadi uh, semuanya harus uh, sinergi ya Uh, I was discussing with the colleagues earlier on that one of the characteristics of, uh, of an infectious disease uh, emergency is that very often it's far more labor intensive of human resources per patient than your mass casualty situation, for example. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to see the situation unfold. Moving on, I would say it's very important to remember that there is no golden plan. Um, each health facility has their own characteristics, their own context. Uh, and I think that's why I cannot today give you um, a, a plan that will, that will fit to everybody. Um, so what the only thing I can give are some uh, tips and recommendations. Ya, uh, jadi di dalam membuat plan, di dalam uh, preparedness ini, tidak ada golden plan, tidak ada satu plan yang bisa diduplikasi ke semua fasilitas. Jadi kita harus melihat karakteristik konteks karena masing-masing fasilitas kesehatan pasti mempunyai permasalahan karakteristik dan konteks yang berbeda-beda. One of the recommendations that uh, we have from internal from MSF, uh, uh, as an organization we run uh, probably thousands of health facilities ourselves around the world. So all of these plans are also plans that we're implementing in our own health structures. Uh, Dr. Chandra, I think, uh, can uh, attest to his experience in Afghanistan yeah. working for MSF. So what we do in our hospitals whenever there's an emergency is we definitely have an emergency team. And this team is an interdepartmental team. And in order to develop a plan for the specific facility, we make sure that it's an interdepartmental and a collaborative plan. With, yeah? Okay. Yeah, uh, MSF sebagai International Humanitarian Organisasi, kami punya seribu, ribuan uh, fasilitas kesehatan di seluruh dunia, dan setiap uh, rumah sakit, setiap fasilitas kesehatan, kita punya emergency response teams yang terdiri dari interdepartment jadi bukan hanya medical dan di dalam ada beberapa departemen yang uh, harus saling berkolaborasi dan bagaimana membuat satu satu uh, plan yang baik. Yeah, I think the main recommendation here is that you do not give the task to develop an emergency response plan to your hospital manager 
and leave him or her alone with it. Uh, chances are, if you give it to a hospital uh, manager, um, ah, no offense, but chances are, if there's one person who's sitting alone with the, with the emergency response plan, chances are you will forget something, some department, um, which is why it's important to have it as an interdisciplinary and a collaborative um, process. Ya, yeah, uh, dalam membuat hospital management uh, plan di dalam tugas-tugas mempersiapkan fasilitas kesehatan ini bukan hanya tugas sebag, uh, dari medical manager, tapi bagaimana kolaboratif interdisiplin dari beberapa bidang yang akan mengisi kalau seandainya hanya diisi oleh uh, hospital manager atau orang-orang yang berada dalam medical akan ada banyak uh, banyak cap, banyak banyak poin yang terlupa. Okay, so what's the task of your hospital uh, COVID team? Uh, one of the key uh, points and very first points that you need to do uh, in developing any response to any outbreak is you need to assess your own capacities, uh, which ultimately means you need to do a general head to toe uh, I can say it's like a triage of your own facility, um, which means you need to look at your general structure. You need to look at the layout. Do you have enough space? Um, what are the activities of your facility? What are the specializations of your staff? So you've got your architecture, your layout, your ventilation, your state of repair. Um, uh, I've seen many facilities that uh, do not have adequate ventilation, for example. So looking at uh, these kind of infectious respiratory, uh, infectious disease situations, ventilation is a, is a very important point. Then you need to analyze what, what services do you offer? Do you have uh, isolation units? Do you have uh, laboratories? Uh, do you have outpatient services? Uh, every facility is different, obviously. Um, then you look at your attendance rate. How many people usually come to your facility on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis? What is your general flow of patients? Um, how many beds do you have? How many uh, support uh, uh, <coughs> facilities do you have within your infrastructure? It's your blueprint of your facility. Based on that, you can then move forward in making your plans. Your staffing, of course, is your bloodline um, to providing any services. So you need to look at what staff do you have in Harappa and Kita? Do you have primarily cardiologists or would you have uh, doctors who would also be able to take care of um, uh, positive cases if need be? Um, are your nurses at outpatient level um, maybe not trained to do screening and triage for COVID because they are used to seeing people coming in with strokes or heart attacks, you know? Um, maybe your cleaning staff is not used to dealing with infectious disease um, protocols because you're a, a heart hospital, you know? So it's important to look at what, what do I have, what are my numbers and what are their trainings? Then, of course, we need to look at the flows. How do we usually generate a patient flow within our hospital? Is that something that is conducive or obstructive to, um, to, uh, to COVID, for example? Um, maybe I'm moving too fast. Yeah, uh, no, it's okay. Yeah, jadi yang pertama yang kita lakukan dari COVID-19 team ini, ketika kita harus mengeses dulu uh, situasinya kita. Yang pertama, bagaimana kita melihat struktur dari uh, rumah sakit kita, kemudian bagaimana layoutnya, bagaimana arsitekturnya, bagaimana desainnya, kemudian ruang ventilasi, area ventilasinya, alur udara, kemudian uh, apa aja yang kita punya, laboratorium, ruang isolasi, negative pressure, kemudian kita ngelihat lagi berapa kira-kira kunjungan pasien kita, kemudian berapa bed yang kita punya, kemudian staff-staff ini yang penting, Ketika kita melihat selama ini apakah staf kita mempunyai satu kualifikasi yang sesuai dengan COVID-19 ini. Karena seperti yang dibilang tadi ketika cleaner tidak mengetahui bagaimana menghandle 
pembersihan atau disinfektan dari COVID-19 ini berarti perlu kita training. Kemudian ada beberapa hal dan kualifikasi yang perlu kita lihat detail uh, untuk mengakses kekuatan kita. Kemudian pasien flow, staff dan pengunjung juga. Okay. The last point here is the equipment and the materials. Of course, yeah. we know that one of the big problems right now is the lack of PPE, uh, and I think um, this is where uh, COVID-19 uh, is different than your mass casualty preparedness plan, because in mass casualty you would assess your necessities for bandaging, for example, and I'm sure that very few hospitals have thought about pre-stocking up on PPE. Um, and that's why we're seeing uh, a, a global shortage as well. Um, this is again lessons learned. Okay. Ya, uh, kemudian kita harus melihat prosedur dari uh, pencegahan dan kontrol infeksi dan ini yang berbeda sedikit dengan mass casualty plan. Ketika kita harus melihat dari equipment dan material yang kita punya, ini jadi satu permasalahan yang ada juga di sekarang di uh, rumah sakit rumah sakit. Bagaimana uh, PPE itu jadi hal yang penting di dalam uh, persiapan kita. Uh, this is the the crucial part, of course, is after your physical assessment and your administrative assessment, because the first slide that I just showed is an administrative assessment, is you're doing, um, you will need to look at that baseline. You can use that assessment as your baseline of what you could potentially uh, contribute to the response. Um, you have to do an assessment on how likely are you to receive suspected cases, what capacity do you have to manage, manage multiple cases. And then the tricky question is what do you do if you don't have the staff or the materials or the facilities or the space? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, di sini kita akan coba melihat bagaimana skenario dan eskalasi jadi langkah-langkah yang perlu kita ambil uh, dan kita coba melihat dari beberapa faktor uh, dari situasi yang dihadapi oleh fasilitas kita. Jadi bagaimana kita menerima, apakah kita menerima, kalau di tabel bisa kita melihat tidak ada kasus, kemudian ada confirm case, uh, tapi bukan di areanya kita. Nah kita bisa melihat di tabel itu, tapi sekarang bagaimana kita melihat skenario dari beberapa faktor yang ada. Hmm. Uh, one of the... Sorry? You need, you need the okay. No. That's okay. One of the um, key questions, of course, and I mentioned this to Dr. Chandra before this presentation, is um, as part of uh, global humanitarian and medical ethics, the principles of do no harm are uh, still primary to what we do. And I think that also that always needs to be part of the considerations as well. If if you do not have the staff or the material or the facilities to either keep your staff safe, your patients safe, or the people your patients are coming in with, sometimes it is better not to do anything. I know that everybody wants to respond and wants to contribute as much as possible, but the reality is that you need to do a um, uh, a conscious. Um, and sober assessment of, of your capacity and your capabilities. Uh, dalam menilai dari uh, apa yang kita punya, kita perlu melihat kembali lagi kalau tujuan kita do not harm, bagaimana kita tidak membuat satu, uh, tidak mencelakakan, tidak membahayakan, dan bagaimana kita meyakinkan kalau tindakan kita benar-benar um, mementingkan keselamatan dari staff, keselamatan dari pasien, Dan ketika kita tidak, tidak punya material, tidak punya staff, kekurangan staff, kemudian fasilitas kita terbatas, ada baiknya lebih baik ketika kita tidak punya kemampuan itu, lebih baik kita tidak melakukan apa-apa. Kira-kira e, gambarannya seperti itu, ketika skenario-nya ternyata setelah kita hitung, kita tidak punya kekuatan, banyak keterbatasan, dan ini akan membahayakan, lebih baik kita tidak melakukan tindakan. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that, of course, determines your scaling up and your escalation steps as well. Uh, many facilities will not be able to escalate because they do not have isolation units, they do not have the specialists, they do not have the lab capacity and so on. 
So that those decisions will always determine your escalation steps. Ya, ini juga akan berhubungan dengan eskalasi stepnya kita bagaimana kita ningkatin uh, fasilitas kita ketika kita tidak punya laboratorium misalnya kita bisa membuat laboratorium, laboratorium ketika tidak punya standar PPI apa yang akan kita lakukan untuk eskalasi stepnya kita ini di di tabel ini kita bisa melihat ada beberapa skenario kemudian ada beberapa faktor yang mungkin uh, bisa dilihat sebagai eskalasi step dan skenario yang ada oke okay. So that was the general basics, the little bit of the background. Um, I think it's important that we had those two or three slides to understand that every context is, set, is individual, every facility is individual. There is no golden uh, emergency preparedness plan. Um, there is no one size fits all. Uh, it's an interdepartmental, interdisciplinary procedure to analyze your capabilities and constantly reanalyze. This is a dynamic process as well. Yeah. Uh, seperti yang disebutkan sebelumnya, tidak ada tidak ada satu prosedur yang bisa, satu skenario yang bisa dipakai di semua fasilitas, tidak ada golden plan. Jadi bagaimana kita melakukan kolaboratif dan inter uh, department. Jadi bagaimana kolaborasi antar department untuk membuat plan ini. So we'll go through it a little bit more now. We'll go, we'll look at some of the departments, some of the recommendations. The, the next part of the presentation is a lot more practical, I think. Yeah, nanti kita akan belajar yang lebih praktikal. So the administrative, sorry, the administrative and organization of care, of course, you want to avoid an outpatient setting with a lot of people standing in one location, potentially spreading uh, diseases to each other, right? Um, this is just because we like talking about uh, patient flow and uh, and staff flow and so on. This is a map of one of uh, MSF's Ebola treatment centers from West Africa. And you can see that it's very detailed. Uh, of course, nobody has the space to uh, develop uh, a COVID Uh, treatment unit uh, in especially in congested Jakarta uh, but maybe in other places. What is important here is that we always make sure that we separated pa patient flow from staff flow and that you have clear areas of red and green. So your infection, your infectious areas and your green areas. Um, I'm not going to discuss this, pa this picture in too much detail. I think we will share these slides after the uh, presentation anyway, and if you're interested in looking at them, and again, if you have more questions, we can always get back to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, dalam penyusunan dan pengorganisasian dari administrasi ini, langkah administrasi ini kita per, kita tidak uh, menginginkan adanya pengumpulan dari pasien dan staff atau pengumpulan orang yang terlalu banyak yang akan membuat penyebaran virus semakin masif. Jadi kita perlu menyusun dari patient flow, staff flow, kemudian kita perlu uh, membuat satu area apakah green, red. Ini salah satu contoh map uh, peta atau skema yang dibuat oleh MSF di Afrika untuk penanganan Ebola. Jadi kita bisa melihat ada flow yang berbeda antara uh, staff masuk dan keluar, kemudian alur pasien juga berbeda dan dari sini kita bisa melihat kalau tidak sangat kecil kemungkinan untuk terjadi perpindahan dari uh, infeksi. Hmm. So for the basic principles of flow, what you have is we usually develop a system of screening, triage, and then consultation. The screening, I think, this is not something that is new. Um, I've seen it in a lot of hospitals and a lot of puskesmas around uh, uh, that I've visited in the last couple of days and weeks. A lot of facilities have now implemented um, a system of a screening, a pre-entry screening, um, uh, and then you go into your into your red zone. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I think I can move on. Yeah. yeah. So in your screening, what do you do in your screening? Um, one of the recommendations is that in the, the screening needs to make sure that you talk to all patients. There are the standard procedures of try to make sure that your the personnel who is doing the screening um, is well informed, well equipped, um, and knows the procedures very well. Keeps a distance because this is also about protecting them as much as it is about protecting uh, and providing services to the patients. Ya, jadi bagaimana kita uh, memastikan uh, pola screening ini dari mulai petugasnya bagaimana petugasnya mengetahui informasi yang sangat benar, detail dan bisa menjelaskan kemudian perlengkapan yang lengkap untuk screening ini karena ini satu tempat yang uh, sebagai batas paling luar tadi Daniel cerita tentang bagaimana ketika dia melihat beberapa fasilitas kesehatan sudah mem memulai screening atau pre screening di fasilitas kesehatannya. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I think the government you have uh, screening questions, screening questionnaire. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, questionnaire. Okay. Um, what we would recommend always is to make sure that the screening is Uh, done outside the facility. We recommend that this is done before people enter into the facility so that you can then do send them to a specific triage. Um, the screening, of course, uh, should always protect the, the dignity of the patients. I think these are where the medical ethics come in play as well. Uh, we should make sure that we don't stigmatize people, uh, that these questions can be uh, asked in a, in a, in a as much as possible a confidential and non stigmatizing way. Oke, okay. kemudian bagaimana ketika petugas dari screening uh, dipastikan untuk uh, menghormati pasien dan kemudian dari kuesioner yang diberikan atau pertanyaan yang diberikan tidak memberikan stigma dan kerahasiaan dari pasien. Hmm. Uh, I don't want to go into the questions right now. I think the screening questions are constantly also developing as we learn more about this new uh, this new disease. Um, I read somewhere that smell and taste is also now a uh, a factor that is that is being asked. Um, so I think as more knowledge is coming, I think the screening itself can yeah. be um, it can be perfected. Uh, even more because yeah. now we know that fever monitoring for example is not necessarily the best screening tool um, as we know that viral shedding um, very often happens in people who are asymptomatic ya yeah. yeah, dalam melakukan screening sekarang kita tidak akan ngebahas detail tentang pertanyaan dalam screening tapi kita harus melihat perkembangan uh, virus ini sendiri karena ada beberapa perkembangan yang terjadi dan simptom yang mungkin jadi satu petunjuk yang berbeda untuk screen ini kita harus terus melihat update. Yeah, so I would recommend to everybody to maintain updates, to stay updated, and to follow the latest uh, scientific uh, developments. Um, triage, I think, becomes a little bit more clinical. I think um, again, this this follows the latest scientific developments after the screening moving on to a designated triage which would which always is a little bit more clinical um, is the natural step what we um, what we recommend in triage is that that's a location where you already commence taking a logbook uh, of the patients of the suspected patients um, to make sure that you can uh, you can contact them again yeah. if they are deep discharged but also to make sure that it's a tool that can be used for potential contact tracing yeah. ya uh, untuk triase ini juga seperti yang sudah umum yang dilakukan di rumah sakit sebelumnya tapi ada catatan penting yang coba diberikan rekomendasi untuk membuat logbook jadi logbook ini nanti akan menjadi satu panduan tracing kita ketika ternyata uh, dari trias kemudian kita temukan menunggu hasil laboratorium dan pasien positif dan kita bisa mendeteksi kontak tra uh, tracing dari si pasien tersebut. Mm -hmm. uh, 
again, mm -hmm. I, we're not going to go into the case management, so screening, triage, and uh, and case management. I think that's a technical discussion that uh, I will leave to uh, to have maybe at a different webinar. Um, when considering separate flows, I think it is important to remember, if you're going to do a flow of a red and green, it's important to remember the patients, the staff, the waste, the laundry. It's important to avoid unnecessary contact already in the screening and in the triage. So if you have a patient who comes in with um, seven family members, and that per person is going through screening, and that person is being screened as to potentially going into the triage, the COVID triage area, you need to already there separate the six remaining or yeah. the seven family members. Yeah. So you don't overcrowd, you don't uh, expose people. It is the same thing for your nurses. You minimize ward entries. You don't want people walking in and out. This is important for human resource scheduling. You will have designated staff in designated areas uh, to minimize people moving back and forth. This is not just the health staff, but is also the cleaning staff. Uh, so make sure that if you have a cleaner, for example, who is coming in to sweep the floor in the triage area, make sure that the staff does not immediately go to your green zone outpatient area to sweep the floor there. Make sure that they again go out and decontaminate themselves, hand washing um, and so on. If they feel that they have been exposed, make sure that they are they're, uh, decontaminating themselves. Okay? Okay, uh, ketika kita akan berbicara tentang pemisahan dari flu, kita coba melihat bagaimana kebutuhan dari misalnya dari trias ke ketika sudah dimasukkan ke suspek ke yang positif bagaimana pasien dan keluarganya sudah mulai dipisah terus kemudian bagaimana perawat hal-hal kecil seperti perawat jalur masuk dan keluar kemudian perawat yang hands on dan lain-lainnya ini kita atur lebih detail kemudian cleaner ketika cleaner masuk ke area uh, covid kemudian penyediaan dari uh, cuci tangan kemudian Uh, alcohol rub dan lain-lainnya ini yang perlu kita pisahkan di dalam flow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for your resource management, it's important to ask yourselves the questions: Do my staff have protocols? Do we have all the SOPs? Are my staff trained? Again, the same questions as before. Are the materials available at every step? At screening, are the materials available at uh, triage consultation? Do we have reporting tools? Uh, do we have proper staff scheduling and rotation in place? Um, do we have staff health protocols for our own staff? In case of exposure, do we have isolation protocols? Do we have enough staff to fill the gaps in case my staff are exposed and they are in isolation? If I only have one doctor and that one doctor is exposed, what does that mean for our services? Um, one of the things that I mentioned to Dr. Chandra as well earlier was when looking at your services, remember all of the other critical services. Uh, many hospitals also offer vital services to other things like a maternity ward yeah. or out, other outpatient services. I'm sure that your heart attacks and your strokes do not stop just because there, are, there is COVID. A pregnancy, as far as I know, does not go on lockdown. The baby will come out after nine months. <laughs> so these services still have to be provided, and that's then part of the green. Uh, you need to make sure that your 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 mindset is in that area as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. Jadi ada beberapa hal yang perlu kita melihat. Dari, dari hal yang tidak bisa kita tunda dan fasilitas dan layanan rumah sakit yang memang harus tetap berjalan seperti mungkin maternity terus kemudian kita tidak bisa menunggu ketika uh, ada orang harus melahirkan terus kemudian ada beberapa kecelakaan dan hal-hal yang umum yang jadi pertimbangan ini harus tetap berjalan oke okay. We'll go a little bit faster through the next couple of slides because I think many of them are relatively simple. We have a, 
uh, developed a COVID checklist for each um, department. And this is, again, this is an internal checklist. Uh, um, we're willing to share it with whoever would like to have it. This is just a screenshot. So don't squint your eyes and try and look at this too closely. We can share it for those who are interested. Okay. Ya, jadi uh, di sini kita punya checklist dari internal MSF sebenarnya bagaimana membuat uh, settingan untuk COVID-19 checklist di beberapa ruangan. Nanti kita punya checklistnya nanti kita akan bagikan di dalam dokumen terpisah karena ini cuma screenshot jadi tidak begitu jelas. Mm -hmm. The roles of all of this, of course, is to make sure that you create a safe environment for your staff, for your patients and for your visitors. You create clear guidelines for your staff so that your staff are not confused about their jobs. Um, make sure that there is clear reporting. The clear reporting makes is easier for your management to make good and clear decisions. If you're a screening staff, do not report to you that they are running out of materials or if you're Uh, try our staff are not reporting that they have been exposed, then it will be difficult for your management to make good management decisions. So reporting needs to be very clear. Um, and then, of course, ensuring continuum of care for basic services. Yeah. Uh, peran dari SOP, jadi bagaimana kita menyiapkan lingkungan yang aman buat staff, patient, dan pengunjung. Selain itu juga guidelines untuk medical staff dan staff-staff lainnya. Kemudian Reporting ini jadi penekanan karena begitu reporting dibuat bagus dan punya tersistem sehingga ini akan uh, mudah untuk melakukan aksi selanjutnya. Oke, okay. so moving along quickly, um, basic hygiene. Of course, standard precautions uh, have to be ensured. I'm sure you're all aware of that. Um, Modes of transmission for COVID, I'm not going to go into detail of this. I think you all pretty much know this. Uh, the droplets, how far and how long uh, does it take for droplets to reach the floor and so on. Um, I think this visualization is always very important for us to remember uh, the safe distance in terms of our physical spacing. We're no longer talking about social spacing, but physical spacing and why. Ya, yeah, uh, untuk basic hygiene, untuk yang materi selanjutnya, basic hygiene, uh, Daniel yang merasa kalau standard vacation, kemudian cup, etiquette, etiquette untuk baik, batuk kita sudah tahu semua. Uh, kemudian gambar ini, dari gambar ini kita bisa ke gambar uh, bagaimana proses dari transmisi dari doplet dan jarak-jarak yang aman dan mana yang harus menjadi concern kita selanjutnya. Keep in mind that the droplet nuclei is still theoretical. Oke. Okay. Uh, harus kita pikirkan kalau droplet nuclei, nuclei still mm. theoretical. So this is not what we're actively looking at right now. Huh? I okay. think it's still theoretical. Yeah, There's no... Yeah. 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 Ini masih theoretical, oh. tapi karena virus ini baru juga, ini masih bisa berkembang selanjutnya. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hand hygiene, you all know why. Uh, the droplets touch the floor, touch uh, surfaces, you touch the surfaces, you will touch your face. Everybody touches his or her face at least every two minutes. Yeah. Hand hygiene, kita mm -hmm. tahu bagaimana proses mm -hmm. uh, penyebarannya dan kemudian bagaimana kebiasaannya kita hampir setiap dua menit kita akan menyentuh wajah dan area kita dan sepertiganya itu akan kontak dengan mukosa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know the main areas of hand hygiene and so on. Uh, moving on to PPE, um, this is these are our internal MSF guidelines for people who should be wearing what kind of PPE. We have differentiated into gloves, surgical mask, N95s, goggles, and gown type. Um, For staff, for example, who have no direct contact with patients, but with their environments, gloves and surgical mask, direct contact with suspects, we say gloves, surgical mask and goggles with disposable gowns, direct contact with the likelihood of getting contact with body fluids, we, inc we include the goggles and then direct contact um, with short rain aerosols and the likelihood of getting in contact we say instead of a surgical mask, we then prefer the N95. Again, 
this will be part of the um, the slides, so we're, you, we'll share this with you. You don't have to read through it. But these are some practical guidelines as to which staff, and, uh, and it gives you some ideas of what PPE might be good for which staff at what entry. Don't forget your receptionists. Don't forget your security staff. Your first point of contact usually is a security company that you have hired and your security guards outside. Don't forget them. This is not only about medical stuff. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Next, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, jadi ini aktivitas dan konteks bagaimana kita menggunakan APD. Jadi ini internal guidelines kita. Jadi kita bisa melihat beberapa skenario. Jadi ketika tidak ada kontak langsung dengan pasien, tapi lingkungan sekitarnya seperti triase, pre triase, kemudian pendaftaran kita melihat checklist cuma gloves dan surgical mask, masker, kemudian kontak langsung dengan suspek atau confirm tapi tidak ada eksposur kecairan tubuh ketika kita ngelihat from case mungkin radiographer menjaga pasien ada tambahan untuk Google nanti ini akan kita bagikan uh, untuk melihat bagaimana MSF secara internal membagi memakai APD PPE donning and doffing, there's WHO um, guidelines on that. We follow them as well. So I'm not going to spend uh, any precious minutes on this. I'm sure that all of this material is available to you already. Uh, number four, cleaning and hygiene. Don't forget this. Um, ensure the most basic principles ensure that you have enough water, that you have your essential requirements, that you have the protocols and that you have ventilation. Ya, jadi untuk lingkungan, kalau tadi kita ngomong setelahnya tentang PPE, PPE bisa dibaca nanti tentang bagaimana memasang dan melepaskan PPE berdasarkan guidelines WHO. Kemudian untuk pembersihan area lingkungan, untuk disinfektan, kita pastikan beberapa hal, pastikan ada water, ada air dan sanitasi yang berjalan dengan lancar dan baik di sana. Kemudian protokol untuk pembersihan dan disinfektan. Kemudian bagaimana dengan ventilasi, karena ini penting untuk flow dari penyebaran virus. Ya. Uh, ceiling fans are not recommended, by the way. It's a one directional flow. Yeah, central AC and ceiling mm. fan mm. tidak direkomendasikan. Mm. Uh, inactivation of your coronavirus. Uh, right now, the two in green, chlorine and ethanol, are the WHO recommendations. Uh, for sulfanios, it's still theoretical. Uh, there still has to be some more analysis. Um, but how to how to deal with it? I think we stick with the WHO guidelines. As far as I know, there are no additional um, IPC precautions. Okay. Uh, for cleaning, huh? Yeah. So it's still standard. Uh, jadi selanjutnya untuk disinfektan kita perlu melihat ada beberapa uh, rekomendasi WHO khususnya klorin dan etanol. Tapi ini masih belum terlalu spesifik ke SARS-CoV-2. Mm. Tapi kita lihat perkembangannya dan sekarang yang masih direkomendasikan oleh WHO adalah klorin dan etanol. Um, general uh, recommendations: single use means single use. It does not mean uh, replacing them, washing them, and so on. Um, I know when there is a shortage, people try to use things several times, but I think especially when in contact with suspected cases, single use means single use. Oke, okay. di sini kita harus tegaskan kalau uh, sekali pakai adalah sekali pakai. Jadi jangan pernah untuk uh, mencoba untuk menggunakannya kembali karena ini sangat berbahaya untuk penyebaran selanjutnya. Mm -hmm. Laundry, same as usual, standard laundry protocols as far as we know. Ya, yeah. untuk laundry, uh, standar protokol seperti yang sudah kita ketahui sebelumnya untuk standar rumah sakit. Mm -hmm. So there are no right now there are no recommendations on any additional. Yeah, tidak ada rekomendasi dan tambahan untuk laundry. Mm -hmm. Reusable PPE items, dipping in a chlorine solution, rinsing with clear water, and then sending them to laundry, washing them, rinsing them, drying them, with a 0.5 chlorine solution for dipping and a 0.1 percent chlorine solution. Ya, untuk uh, PPE yang bisa dikembali, eh, dipakai kembali, uh, seperti bot, sarung tangan dan uh, dan beberapa peralatan, ada beberapa uh, yang ketika kita buka kita cukup 
uh, masukkan ke dalam 0,5 persen klorin, kemudian uh, bilas dengan air, hmm. kirim ke laundry dan di laundry akan direndam selama 5 menit di 0,1 persen klorin, bilas, keringkan dan siap untuk dipakai kembali. Yeah. Goggles, maybe people don't send them to the laundry. Um, I think you will need to discuss that with your with your team, huh? Yeah. Waste management, again, there is nothing new in waste management, same as laundry. It is, I think, important that you talk to your, that you re give a reorientation to your waste management team. Some hospitals outsource their cleaning and their waste management. I know that some private hospitals use ESS for other companies. It's important to talk to those companies. It's important to make sure that they follow the protocols and the procedures that apply to that hospital. Okay. Untuk waste management tidak ada protokol yang baru, tapi ketika kita perlu melihat apakah uh, petugas dari sampah kita adalah in-house atau outsource, dan ketika itu outsource kita perlu mengkomunikasikan dengan pihak outsource untuk uh, memperlakukan protokol sesuai dengan protokol yang uh, kita hmm. kita gunakan. Yeah. Uh, water spills, I think this is standard uh, protocols, don't pour chlorine on top of li liquids but soak it up first before you wash it, these are standard procedures. Huh? Yeah. Pengelolaan sampah cair juga uh, standard prosedur, jadi mm -hmm. ada hal yang perlu di ini kan, tapi standar prosedur untuk penanganan pasien infeksi. Mm -hmm. Managing transportation, uh, I'm almost done. Uh, managing transportation is important because as, as part of your baseline you will not always be able to take care of patients. So what do you do when you have suspected patients coming in through your screening and your triage and you are not, you do not have the capacity to manage these patients? What do you do? Unfortunately what I have seen over the past couple of weeks is that a facility will basically wash their hands and say, go to one of the referral hospitals. Mm. Correct? Yeah. Now, that ultimately means that this patient, we do not know how this suspected case uh, gets to the referral hospital, the referral facility. Correct? Um, public transportation, of course, is not advised. Yeah. Jadi, uh, dalam transportasi pasien, pengelolaan transportasi kita perlu melihat lagi karena kebanyakan e, di rumah sakit menurut Daniel mungkin e, belum mengetahui dan ketika datang ke fasilitas kesehatan hanya bagaimana rujuk ke sana padahal untuk suspek e, kasus kita harus perlu e, manajemen transportasi yang khusus untuk e, pengiriman pasien mm -hmm. Tapi public transportasi tidak kita rekomendasikan. Uh, in public transportation, you cannot uh, guarantee so, uh, social spacing. Huh? Yeah. One of the, we would always say, and the recommendations for ambulance and private transportation is very similar, which means know where you are going before you leave. And this is the advice. So if, if your hospital sends the patient in an ambulance, make sure the ambulance knows. If you're sending the patient independently, make sure the patient knows where they are going. So know the location. Yeah. Um, then of course the protection of your staff, your ambulance and your paramedic staff, which means giving them PPE, if possible giving your patients PPE as well. If they are going in private transportation, is there a possibility of ensuring that is in the, in the private transportation as well. The separation of the driver from the patient, minimize contact, right? In your private car, let's say you have another typical situation that you are coming with uh, seven family members yeah, family. and all of these family members, now that you are discharged from this facility and you're being referred to the referral facility, of course they all want to come with you. Yeah. So are they all going to pack into your little uh, Toyota Avanza? Yeah. That's where the recommendations are. Do not let all of the family members get into the car. Make sure you have a driver in the front and the patient in the back. Try and make sure that the patient understands this. 
take the responsibility as a facility as well that your responsibility does not necessarily end at discharge. If you are referring, you are responsible to a certain extent for that referral as well. Yeah, uh, untuk uh, rujukan bagaimana ketika tadi kita mendapat suspek ke pasien dan ternyata rumah sakit kita tidak punya fasilitas untuk isolasi dan lain-lainnya, bagaimana kita uh, mengirimkan pasien dan kemudian kita sudah tahu lokasi mana yang akan kita tuju sesuai dengan rujukan pemerintah, kemudian uh, melindungi supir ambulans dengan PPI, kemudian memisahkan antara driver, uh, supir dengan uh, pasien, minimal ada jarak, terus kemudian uh, kalau seandainya ada uh, keluarga yang ikut, kita usahakan terpisah dan tidak bersama pasien, karena dalam kasus ini kita anggap suspek. Mm -hmm. And then there's the coordination with the referral site. It would always be good to pre-notify the referral site to make sure that they can prepare for the receival of a suspected case. Kemudian koordinasi dengan rumah sakit rujukan. Jadi kita perlu pemberitahuan dengan pasien kita dengan catatan klinis dan logbook kalau kalau memungkinkan dan ada. Okay. Uh, I think this is a very important point because. Um, uh, yeah, it's a point that I, I feel is a is of strong concern. Yeah, ini satu point penting menurut Daniel karena ini satu concern yang selama ini tidak dianggap sebagai satu concern. The last point is the management of the dead. Um, as far as we know, it is standard dead body management. Uh, I think we just have to remind our mortuary um, personnel. Uh, that there is still the necessity to wear a certain amount of PPE, uh, there is the necessity to observe hand hygiene, uh, that you have enough body bags and so on. It is important also to consider the context, the religious context, the, access, the acceptance and the local rituals. I think this is also um, part, of, part of the management. Of, ya. of the dead. Nah, selanjutnya bagaimana pengelolaan dari uh, jasad tubuh, kematian pasien, terus kemudian uh, kita ngelihat ada standar dead body management yang akan kita uh, gunakan, tapi ada perlakuan khusus untuk hmm. APD jika petugas kesehatan berurusan dengan jasad pasien, mungkin droplet, terus cairan dan lain-lainnya, kemudian hygiene, kemudian syarat untuk uh, misalnya tidak ada peti mati cairan transport kita butuh kantong ayat kemudian kapas untuk menyerap cairan tubuh dan lain-lainnya ada beberapa di sini dan e, pertimbangkan konteks untuk penerimaan dan ritual lokal this is the clinical part so there's no the standard dead body management from a from a from an SOP point of view one of my doctor colleagues um, uh, mentioned that he had experienced uh, family members that had seen their loved ones go into isolation and the next time they saw the body was at the graveyard. So mental health and support to family I think is also something that needs to be thought about because this is it is a it is a pretty special and unique situation. Ini satu catatan khusus ketika kita harus mempertimbangkan ketika sejak dari mulai positive case kita tidak bisa menemui pasien dari bahkan e, melihat e, dan berbicara dengan pasien sampai akhirnya misalkan pasien meninggal dan kita juga tidak bisa melihat e, jenazahnya ini jadi satu hal penting catatan buat kita medis untuk menyiapkan mental health e, untuk mendampingi keluarga hmm. terima kasih yeah. Yeah.